Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 is where we begin today's study. And I do hope that you can open your Bible to Matthew chapter 18. Very important message today. And, well, they're all important. They're all the Word of God. But I think this one has special significance and I think there's a lot of relevance to a lot of people's lives. So, Matthew 18, verse 21. Remember, you can study all of God's Word with me any time that you want to using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. There are four complete series going on, five, all archived, 37 years of teaching since the very beginning of Scripture verse by verse, all there at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Matthew eighteen twenty one Then came Peter to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Peter was probably grinning when he said, till seven times. I mean, he really thought he was going out on a limb and way beyond the call of duty when he suggested that somebody should be forgiven seven times. And the reason he would have thought that is because the religious leaders of that day taught that no one should be forgiven more than three times. After that, forget it. Well, he may have thought Jesus was surprised, would be surprised at his answer. He's going to be the one who was surprised. Look at 22. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And I take the Bible literally, but there are figures of speech in the, within the realm of literalness, as we all know. And Jesus is not saying to keep track of a person's sins until, until, and sins against you, until they reach 490, 70 times 7, and then stop forgiving. He wasn't giving a new number here, a new limit. Jesus is saying, don't put a limit at all on the number of times that you forgive a person. Now who's shocked? 23, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. See, Peter knew that, I should say Jesus knew that Peter and the other apostles were shocked at his answer because he simply were not taught that. So he's going to teach a parable to illustrate his answer. And he refers to the kingdom of heaven here in verse 23. And that is speaking of the church, Christianity, the kingdom of heaven, the spiritual kingdom with Jesus as king of every single person who has repented and received him as Lord and Savior. That's the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying, listen up, Christians. I'm talking to you, Christians. Christians, this is how I want you to handle forgiveness. And the servants in this story referred to the ref, referred to the king's governors who oversaw sections of land within the kingdom so you had the king in charge of everything then you had the servants who were governors in charge of certain sections it was their job to collect taxes in their specific section and give those taxes to the king 24 and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. In today's money, possibly 15, 20 billion dollars. Now, to give you an idea how much money that was back in those days, it took a worker, an average worker, 20 years to earn one talent. 
So this man that they brought before the king was in a hopeless situation. He had, he had a debt of 10,000 talents to the king, and it takes 20 years to earn one talent. Yeah, hopeless. That's our Lord's point, 25. But for as much as he had nothing with which to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. If you could not pay your bet, debt back in those days, you, were, you worked as a slave until the debt was paid off. Well, this is what the king orders in this story. Perfectly, perfectly normal in that day and age. But along with this man being sold into slavery, his wife and children were to be sold as well. 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. The guy didn't have anything. Even be, the, top, the top payment for a, the best slave possible would be one talent. So even if he got the top price and his wife got the top price, and let's say he had five kids, big deal, seven talents, you owe 10,000. He knew his he knew his situation was completely hopeless. He was bankrupt. He was in trouble. There was nothing he could do about any of it. And this man may have blown it in a big way. And he certainly did. But at least he had the character and the courage to come clean to admit it. He didn't deny his debt. He didn't make up any excuses for his debt. He didn't even try to bargain. Instead, this man did the only thing that he could do, which is fall down like a beggar and take full responsibility for his guilt. 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. The king felt compassion. So he did a very magnanimous thing. He forgave this man his 10,000 10, talent debt. Billions of dollars. And he released him. Because he had compassion on him. The king could have made this man a slave. He could have made his wife and all his children a slave for the rest of their lives. But instead... He canceled their debt, his debt. See, the man did not bargain. He did not make up excuses. He came clean. He confessed his guilt and cried for mercy. And immediately, this king canceled his debt. 28. Watch this. Right when you start feeling good about this guy, you run into 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. Now, one hundred pence was not a small amount. It was equal to one hundred days' wages. Not a small amount. But nothing compared to what this man had owed the king. And this man, who had just been forgiven his huge debt, right after being forgiven, walked out, grabbed this other man who owed him, grabbed him by the throat before he could even answer. He didn't even give him a chance to do what he had done, which is fall on his knees and ask for forgiveness and ask for mercy. He just grabbed him by the throat. Well, look at 29. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And did you recognize the fact that the man who owed 
the 100 pence to this fella said the exact same thing that this man said to the king about his debt. Same words. And as soon as the servant of that king, who had been forgiven, heard these words, it should have immediately rung a bell in his mind. That's exactly what I said to the king before he forgave me. Well, what happened? Look at verse 30. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. That self-righteous, arrogant man was willing, unwilling, I should say, to forgive and unwilling to show mercy. Although he was not unwilling to receive forgiveness and mercy. That was a different story. He was more than willing to ask for mercy and accept it when the king gave it to him. But even though this man used the exact same words, he was unwilling to show mercy to him. Oh, he must have thought that he was really something, don't you think? He must have thought that he was a bigger big shot than even the king. Yeah, I'm, I'm worthy to be shown mercy. It's all right for somebody like the king to show me mercy, but I'm so important, I'm not going to show mercy to this fellow who owed me a fraction of what I owed the king. 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called them, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou besoughtest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? He can't believe it. He's outraged. He showed mercy. He expected the same kind of mercy to be shown toward others by this man. And he was more than disappointed. And the point of this that Jesus is trying to make is that God says something like what this, what this man did. God says that something like what this man did is wicked. That's how God described it. This is, he was a wicked man for not forgiving. So we better not tell God that we cannot be kind and we better... We better not tell God, I'm talking about Christians, we Christians better not tell God that we can't be kind to somebody who has been unkind to us. We better not be telling God that we can't be magnanimous, we can't be forgiving, we can't show mercy. We better not tell God that we can't forgive because number one, it's not true. Because it's an act of your will. And God says that if you forgive, if you refuse to forgive, as a Christian, you refuse to forgive others who have sinned against you and have confessed, like this man in this story did. Both of the men confessed. The king forgave. The man who had been forgiven refused to forgive. But both confessed. Both should have been treated the same way. And if you refuse to forgive as a Christian, after all that you have been forgiven by God, then you don't have to wonder. God says, you are wicked. You are wicked. Any Christian 
who will not forgive someone who repents and confesses their sins to them is a wicked person. They must think they're better than God. Oh, it's okay if God forgives me my multitude of sins, too many to count. I'll accept that. I'll ask for that and I'll accept it and, and God is right to do it. But I, I must be better than God because I don't feel the need to forgive somebody who sinned against me. When their sin against me doesn't amount to a hill of beans compared to all my sins against God. 34. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the inquisitors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Unforgiveness is a sin that a Christian can have sneak up on them right through the back door of their soul. And some Christians justify their sin of unforgiveness sometimes. But if a Christian does not forgive, when somebody repents and confesses their sin and apologizes to them, if a Christian does not forgive, then it is like that Christian is saying, I'm better than God. Because God forgives when we confess. No matter how many times we've sinned, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, nine. And this king was furious. This man who was forgiven has been unforgiven. All his sins are back on his record and he's going to pay for every last one of them just like he's making that other fellow pay. And now, notice verse 35. Jesus says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother his trespasses. Boy, you better not be holding a grudge. You better not be holding a grudge, Christian. You better not be committing the sin of unforgiveness towards somebody who has repented and confessed their sins to you. You better not be harboring a grudge. Because if you're doing that and you think God doesn't care, it's no big deal, you better listen to what Jesus said right here. Satan wins and you are the big loser if you as a Christian do not forgive those who confess their sin against you, apologize to you. You are the big loser. You lose because you respond sinfully to being sinned against and you will suffer in this life by having your fellowship with God cut off, which includes not hearing, not having God not hear your prayers and not only that, you will be punished for your sins. If you, harb if you continue to harbor unforgiveness, that bitterness, that sin, like any other sin that's not confessed and repented of, will slowly eat away at the fabric of your faith in Jesus Christ because that's what happens when you harbor sin over time and you don't confess and you don't repent. Little by little, that sin eats away at your faith until one day you are as cold as ice toward God himself and you no longer have faith. Oh no, it doesn't happen overnight. But if you continue in that sin or any sin, it will destroy you and you will end up paying for your sin. And you know what that means. I don't have to tell you. Jesus just told you. Jesus just told you, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother his trespasses. What's that? What will the Heavenly Father do unto us? Just back up to verse 34. His Lord was angry. God will be angry at you. 
and delivered him to the inquisitors, the punishers. God will deliver you to the punishers till you shall pay off all that was due God until your sins are paid for. And you know as well as I do, if you know anything about the Bible, that people in hell are paying for their sins and those sins are never paid off because sins against God are just so, so very serious. An eternity of suffering in hell will not pay them off, but you will be there paying for those sins and never paying them off. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. So is unforgiveness a problem? You better believe it, and it's a sin, and it's a serious sin. So if somebody has come into your mind right now as you have listened to this message, if you have, as you have looked at the words of Jesus, if there is somebody that popped into your mind and you are thinking to yourself, I need to forgive that person. I'm holding a grudge against that person. God doesn't say you have to like them. God doesn't say you have to hang out with them. He doesn't say that you have to be their friends. None of that stuff. But you better from your heart forgive them. You better not dwell on what they did. You better not get them back. You better not let the sin of bitterness come in. Because those are all indicators of unforgiveness. Study all of God's word with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible verse by verse. And if you'd like to be a part of Scripture verse by verse, you can be very simple. Pray for me and God's word. That immediately makes you a part of this ministry and I'd appreciate your prayers more than what I can say. Also, when you take a break from studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the donate button, prayerfully give us a Lord may lead. That also makes you an immediate part of this ministry. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture, verse by verse. Thank you for studying with me. So long, everyone.